Yeah, thank, thank for the invitation. I think as the last speaker has to be entertaining. You look at all this food, and I figured it out is uh, the price of free uh, helium loader. So I would suggest the Gordon Conference to buy one of those, so we can easily take the lobster uh, cover off uh, after uh, on the, of the dinner of the traditional. So. Uh, the organizer wanted me to talk about challenges and hot topics, and I think you all know it because over the last two days, uh, the expert lecturers already point out a uh, very interesting subject, forefront research, and everybody has their own taste, right? Like cuisine, so uh, it's impossible to cover uh, high pressure science of what the hot topics. You can see that it's covered from all the way from food science uh, to geoscience to fundamental physics, chemistry all sorts of things. So I can only talk about something I, I know and I'm familiar with. So I would like, uh, just like uh, looking in a crystal ball and see what next, right? So I give a brief introduction, actually give you a rule of thumb of why pressure is so in interesting. Uh, it's very ele uh, elementary, uh, completely cartoon. So when you think about doing an experiment, what you should think. I'm going to high pressure in the late 90, uh, 1990 is because of the structures, because of uh, all this interesting structure came up from ESRF. When CSR opened in 1996, the first experiment they did was solid hydrogen. And uh, I have a crystallography background, and you can see diffraction line from hydrogen, you jump up and down, all right? So, and then, of course, there's a lot of structure of the elemental solids came out, and then I start asking a question, is this a, a law governing structures? Uh, what happened to the electrons? And basically, structure is governed by electrons. So you have to know where the electrons are, and what's a nucleus. So, pressure-induced chemistry, I think chem chemistry come in the, this picture in a big time. Uh, high pressure field traditionally are uh, mostly a geoscientist and hardcore physicists. They go into 750 gigapascal. Uh, chemists work very low pressure, uh, higher than the Professor uh, Winter's uh, kilo, uh, millibar. Uh, we work in kilobar in the GPA, a few GPA. I'm particularly interested in disorder system, like I say about the thing. And I think uh, I would not leave you without talking about theory. So. Uh, I'll give you some thought uh, what the theory should be uh, in the future. So as I said, I'm not a traditional uh, high pressure person, in which I wasn't trained even in high pressure. So I, I, I somehow got in a high pressure by other means. I attend my first uh, conference, actually IU Chris uh, uh, workshop in 1998. So at that time I chaired sections on ice, that's uh, my, uh, my, my field, ice physics. Um, and at that time, the most interesting thing about ice is called a quantum phase. That means it's transition from the ice servant, in which there's a proton attached to the oxygen, and, and then ice 10, in which the oxygen sit between, the hydrogen sit between two oxygen atoms. In between, because of the low potential barrier, the protons can tunnel. So that's a area called quantum phase. So we're very excited about quantum phase, and then, uh, John Lofty, I still remember, is sitting in front of me and I turn around and me, John, they already did ice, uh, what are we going to do? Well, I said, oh, treat well, uh, put something in the diamond cell, you will see something new. That was 20 years ago, roughly. So why don't you do gas hydrates? Uh, because that's what I start. Uh, my career is actually doing gas hydrates. So, well, the lovely thing is in this field, I think the collaboration between experimentalists and theoreticians are very closed. Traditional, when I did my PhD, the people would joke at quantum chemists. Uh, uh, you know, don't, they don't trust a result at all at that time with uh, technology in the 70s and 80s when I did my graduate school. So that was really rewarding. We go to uh, a high person community, you have an idea, people actually do it, right? So we put uh, methane hydrate, uh, we make uh, methane hydrate, and then uh, John uh, put it uh, in a diamond and cell. And what happened was quite interesting. We find actually a new structure. It's called methane hydrate three. It's uh, actually uh, the ice lattice with the methane with a big ball there, uh, trapped in the channel. Wow! The genius of John is he can turn it into a story for nature. All right, it's a magazine. Remember nature. So, if they say that, well, uh, that's a mystery about the methane content of uh, Titan. Titan is uh, one of the satellite moon of uh, 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 of Saturn. 
And uh, he said because there was a sea of uh, uh, hydrate and occasional volcanic activity break up the hydrate, so refill up the methane. It turned out, I think it is true, I, uh, I think uh, the mission, uh, Cassini uh, mission, uh, uh, showed that it might be some uh, validity to that. So, I end my talk. What's the challenge? I mean, you just think up putting in the diamond in your cell and you press it, you got something new. Well, of course, uh, there's a reason for that. If you look at uh, what's happening uh, when you apply pressure to the electron density, uh, that's first year chemistry. Uh, the, the lower uh, diagram there. We know that uh, alkaline metals are big. The reason is very simple. They have S orbital, outer S orbital, and they're all shielded. So the effective nuclear charge is very little. So the electrons are very diffuse. So they are big. We also, uh, you have talked about chemists, transition metals are very compact. They are tight. Because the D orbital have no shielding. The 3D orbital have no note. The wave function here have no note. The number of notes is N minus L minus 1. The principal quantum number n minus isomorphic quantum number l and minus one. So 3D have absolutely no node. So it feel all the nuclear charge is unscreened. So it's tight, the electron. So if you're a good chemist, look at the periodic table, you can predict properties because of the periodic trend of the size of the atom and the number of electrons uh, of the atom uh, carries. When you compress it to one uh, terapascal, 1,000 GPA, uh, there's absolutely no difference. So that's why you put any uh, metals and you compress it, you got a new funny structures. And that's why the heydays of the 19, uh, late 1990, uh, 2005, when people start using really high resolution synchrotron radiation and can uh, achieve pressure much higher than 50 GPA, you can uh, got a very nice result and very surprising. You recast this number of pressure into somewhat of PV energy, all right? You will see that when you have appointment to 0.5 EV, and there's a hydrogen bond, uh, OH bond is around 5 EV, and CH is around uh, 10 of EV, right? So you can see that and match it with the pressure, you know that something's going to happen. So if someone haven't studied this compound, you throw it in there and compress it with that pressure, I bet you're going to find something else if you can answer the question uh, what it is. Now, think about it, it's very simple, actually. It's a particle in a box, and I think everybody here probably have a training a particle in a box. That's the first thing you do before you solve the Schrodinger equation, all right? So the energy is proportional, inversely proportional to the square of the dimension of the box. You compress the atoms, what happened? The electron level go up. It basically, the low, uh, highest uh, uh, occupied orbital become higher and higher energy. Now, for alkaline metal, the ionization energy is already low. So you compress it, it just go away. So it go away, where to go? So you see the positive charge from the lattice, and they condense, they pair up for form this so-called electrocyte. All right? But there are problems, because I haven't explained, but then everything will have, to have the close track packing with the electron in the interstitial site. So FCC is one of the highest packing. It, uh, the electric side has to be in the interstitial site. It's just tetrahedral and octahedral site. It's very simple. Nothing to that. Now, you took a silicon, in which is a prototype uh, covalent compound. You compress it. What happened? So the energy level goes up, right? Because it's a particle in box. You start mixing with the d orbitals. And the d orbital overlap, the electron delocalized, may become a metal. So silicon was a metal. At uh, 12 GPA, you compress it. Now, what is important is when you go from an insulator to a metal, of a metal to an insulator, there's a region in which there is instability. And in instability, it gives you the interesting phenomenon, all these uh, funny structures. The, all this funny structure is due to some sort of electronic instability. I don't know why. I can't explain it. But it basically electron instability. Why is a long modulated to like barium in which has 700 atom per unit cell? Where is the uh, incommensurate vector? I don't know, but I know that that's due to that, right? And superconductivity is due to one form of dynamical Young-Taylor effect. So you always uh, find 
superconductivity and air, uh, elemental solids. It's, you compress it, all of them have superconductivity, some pressure point. All right, because they want to open a gap, the metal, and, uh, and become an insulator. So that's how you think when you do the experiment with simple elements or binary alloys. So you want to desire experiment, you want to see something new, think about how the electrons sit in the ground state, what happened, I put pressure on it, and what will you expect, all right? So that's it, right? So what's the hot topic? Uh, well, the hottest topic is uh, this two paper. You might have not the chance, you might have heard of it, or might not have the chance to read it, because it just came up last week in Nature. One is, of, of course, the superconductivity of uh, hydrogen sulfide. When you compress it, it reaches 200 Kelvin, dry eye temperature. All right? You can do it at home, dry eyes. All right? And uh, this measurement apparently is conventional PCS. That means it's phonon mediated uh, process. Now, that's an interesting thing. All right? They have the magnetic measurement. You can see that if you read your textbook uh, on superconductivity, it's a type 2 behavior of, uh, of a superconductivity. So I leave it uh, like uh, here because it's a lot more to study of this. And in fact, they don't know the structure. All right? So what's causing it is, uh, is a mystery. So this came out even more recent, three days ago, when I was preparing the, the talk. I do a search. And uh, Dubovinsky in, uh, in Bayreuth uh, achieved a pressure of 750 GPA. That's the highest pressure achieved. What uh, impressed me is look at this diff uh, two diffraction pattern. Okay, if you have done high pressure diffraction, uh, I would just drop. Look at the resolution. Look at the line width. Some people with 20 GPA is already the peaks missing. Okay, uh, osmium. In fact, uh, Hafland uh, published a PRL many years ago. Uh, it's one of the compounds you come back to 100 GPA. No medium. It doesn't broaden at all. But it carry around to 750 GPA, all right? And that's uh, actually a couple of phase transition. I don't want to go through it. <coughs> At that uh, pressure existing 400 GPA, they think actually the core participate in some sort of interaction. You can call it bonding, but there's some sort of interaction. And that's apparently is the first evidence of something happening. If you compress something too close together, the core electrons start to react. And that's, a, that's something to it, actually, you think about it. I, I will get back to it. So while well, this list too, we'll, some of you will work for a couple of years, all right, just to sort it out. And that's really good physics and uh, good chemistry. All right, whatever you like to call it. There's no boundary signs. So what is uh, high pressure to me? High pressure to me is a tool to, si uh, to solve a scientific problem. I don't develop any high pressure things. Uh, I, I, I do experiment and maybe design something new, but uh, really not uh, uh, something really hang on uh, uh, doing a cell and thing like that. It's a very high, uh, versatile adjustable parameter. It's a uh, well saying, you all know that, uh, a previous lecturer already said it. I often look at fundamental scientific problem. That's how I can use one system, the pressure, just adjustment parameter ex uh, explaining fundamental physics. All this development I show you in the two paper is all because of technical development. The reason they have uh, this uh, diffraction pattern, you know what's the size of a sample? The micron. So the beam has to be micron or some micron. What impressive you look at uh, 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 something there is called William, right? RE. Everybody do diffraction will know that. The reason you see that that's a gasket. Now look at the gasket peak. It's so small. So you know the, how, how small the beam is. It only hit get the gasket a little bit. It's really, uh, of course, the development of the, uh, of the diamond cell uh, is an important contribution, but the technical uh, development of the synchrotron diffraction. Over here is impressive. It's not just the high pressure. For the magnetic measurement, uh, element has to design a cell to fit in the squid. Uh, the squid is very small. The bore is very, very small. And you have to uh, tie the coil and measure the magnet uh, magnetization. Uh, it's not a simple task as 200 GPA. 
All right. So there's a technological development. It's basically it's a breakthrough, right, in, in, in the technology. Of course, it contributes to the science itself. So what I'm going to talk about, so that's what uh, I, I say. I want to point out something. You may have heard some of that, the pressure-induced chemical reaction. Uh, photochemistry and photophysics, uh, the interaction of laser-like uh, time-resolved experiment on uh, high pressure is rare. And I think there's an area you can go into. I, is there any general structural principle? There are so many structures have been observed, predicted. I pick at one, can you explain to me? I'm sure any good chemist will explain the structure on methane molecule and a graphite. All right? But I pick out one of the high pressure structures uh, of the element. Can you explain to me why you formed? Okay? And also, of course, uh, theory is important in this area. So what kind of bonding you get or new bonding you get and how you can explain it with what we know uh, so far at the train the canvas. Uh, this is one of the good example. Uh, when you mix a, a silane with a hydrogen, you got a new compound. And Ashcroft immediately say that, okay, well, all the electron is involved, the role of the core orbital involved, so you got a new bonding. So is this a new bonding, all right? So you do a little bit of things, you will find out that uh, cyanine crystalline in it basically FCC lattice. It have octahedral site and tetrahedral site. What you can do is put the hydrogen either in the octahedral site or the tetrahedral site. It turns out it's in the, in the octahedral site. They have very fluctual, there's an MD simulation at 32 GBA. By the way, one thing I want to remind you, when you compress uh, the atom close together, you think the atom are tight, right? No. When you rip up the uh, valence electron, actually the nuclei actually is a very small potential. They move very big uh, and harmonic fluctu uh, fluctual mov movement. The reason we have this concept of tight because the stronger the bond, your force constant becomes bigger, they repulse each other. That's actually not the case because the electron bonding them, then you remove it. So actually, the potential actually uh, is, uh, is bigger. In fact, calcium at 40 GPA, we measure it. The thermal, uh, thermal expansion coefficient is one order b bigger than in uh, normal calcium. All right. The bonding here is fairly simple, actually. It's just a dated bonding of the, uh, of the electron donating from the hydrogen into uh, the lower the lying d orbital of uh, silane. So in a sense, that is a very exciting to uh, form this kind of close cell interaction compound. But at this pressure range, the normal chemistry concepts still work fairly well, and you can quantify it by doing calculation and matching the experiment. I don't want to go into it. But uh, then more things happen. You react xenon with hydrogen, they form a complex. Uh, that's again, uh, someone would like to explain why xenon and hydrogen form a complex and selectively select seven hydrogen. Not eight, not six. Six is an uh, octahedral, is a, you, can, uh, you can explain it, uh, seven. Uh, Paul Lebert, uh did it with the nitrogen with uh, hydrogen. It formed a Carfrey compound. You know the, the hydrogen, uh, the nitrogen is uh, formed the hexagonal ring and the hydrogen in between is trapped it. So very interesting. It uh, occurs a uh, very low pressure to me is uh, 50, less than 50 GPA. It's all a low pressure. I think most of us can safely don't break the diamond cell to do it, right? Well, if we go over 100, you need a steady hand. So, theory can be very helpful. Uh, that's our simulation. So, you were thinking you compress uh, the, the nitrogen at the high pressure, it actually polymerizes. The nice thing is, uh, theoretical uh, calculation analysis of the trajectory give you the chemical information, give you the, the mechanism. Uh, how bonds form and how bonds destroyed. You don't just look at a simulation and say reproduce experiment, that's fine. That's not fine. Because explaining experiment, reproducing experiment is the first step. Explaining the uh, experiment gives you added intellectual contribution to the understanding. All right? You can simulate a lot of things, you can predict a lot of structures. You have, you have to tell me why you found this structure at this particular pressure. And you change it by 10 GPA, you go to another structure. 
the physics and the chemistry is behind it. And that's what we want to learn from theory. So, but the first thing, of course, is to reproduce the experiment. So you see, okay, it seems to agree, like the, that's the pattern to measure on the left-hand side, a simulated density of state. So then you start to look at what happened. And the most interesting uh, uh, phenomenon of this uh, material, when you compress it to high pressure, it polymerizes. When you release it uh, down to 5 GPA, it forms hydrazine, uh, N2H2, then in a circle, and N2. So you, we can see in the simulation, of course, and the hard work is really to look at the trajectory frame by frame to understand why it formed like that, all right? So it's a good combination. Another thing that really amazed me was uh, also the chemistry by the Italian group, extant uh, piece of work. They low CO2 in SiO2 for a particular reason because I heard uh, earlier today say there's a lot of CO2 in the uh, lower mantle. Uh, so I think Hans uh, said that. So that's a reason. Uh, when you have CO2, you have silicate, you have the, some temperature, you have the pressure. What do you get? And they did the first experiment. They put the CO2 in a zeolite, uh, fill it up, and then heat it up. And that they are, uh, can see formation of ABC, the different linkage of the uh, uh, SiO uh, bond. All right. And another thing is the subsequent paper is mo uh, even more impressive. So for one of the systems, they heat it to very high temperature, almost melt the system, and they crunch it back. They form a crystalline solid. And they claim have a crystal-like structure. And uh, well, it's quite interesting. I know Julian very, very well. We worked together 20 years ago. Uh, I have to say, are you sure it's crystallite? Uh, as a chemist, you know that immediately SiO bond is much longer than a CO bond. CO bond is around 1.6, roughly. But uh, SiO is 2, <laughs> all right? So how can you have a structure with both in there? It looks like chemically, it's just insane. So. Well, you can do the calculation. In this case, actually, it's not a model. We take the same zeolite, lower it with the same concentration, and then heat the light out. And you cal can calculate and analyze the, the structures. And those are the structure you will find how it reacts, the CO2 react with the zeolite, and give right the vibrational frequency. And that's uh, the, the free vibrational frequency, the highlight to show the formation of a CO2, SO2, SiO2 compound. So the added uh, understanding is we know the mechanism. When you hit, hit the CO2 at that pressure, at, at that temperature, there's a big fluctual vibration of the oxygen. When it bended, it will attack the long pair, will attack the SiO bond and form the first linkage. And eventually, it polymerized. So that's what the added uh, information you get from the excellent experiment. And then you can now start to do, to think how about other system, all right, without doing experiment or without doing calculations. And that's all, all theory supposed to do is predictive, right? That's, that's uh, what theory should be, all right? So how about this uh, uh, metastable crystallized state? Initially, I don't believe it, it, it exists. So I take the structure and cool it. Now you never will expect a cooler structure will give you a crystalline product. But you can see the incipient formation of the tetrahedron of the CO4 interact with SiO4. So at that time you say, well, I will never get a crystalline structure. You just construct a structure, a model of the SiO4 and, uh, CO, uh, and, and CO4. So there's an optimized structure in IGPA. You look at the beta angle, it's 19.5 degree. Because I have no disordering. My system, the, all the position of the atom are, uh, are in their, uh, all the position. So it is thought tiny, 0.5 degree, 90 degree. You calculate the equation of state, it's definitely more stable than a CO2 plus a SiO2, uh, crystallite. So it's a stable compound, uh, I totally unexpected. I would think it's unstable. This material, actually, you can recover it uh, at a zero uh, GPA, all right? So 
you, we reproduce a, a characteristic Raman infrared spectrum. So that's all, all you can do right now is uh, all standard code will give you the Raman and infrared intensity. And that really helped for us. So I, I showed a picture. I was very impressed with this uh, band scene because this is really the first time I, I see as a pure canvas. Look at people calculating ray constant as uh, Professor Srinitroni uh, uh, talked very detailed yesterday. I love uh, chemical kinetics. Uh, so she already explained it. I, I don't want to point out uh, again, but it's a beautiful piece of work. Then I, I actually have a residual interest a long, long time. You look at this paper here, it's 2003. Uh, people already do chemical reaction in a diamond embryo cell and look at the photophysics, measure the life, the fluorescent lifetime. And the fluorescent lifetime, as you can see, it changes with pressure. It gives you a lot of information on how the uh, uh, electron do the inter-system crossing. If you're in that kind of business of uh, photochemistry, of looking at uh, electron transfer process, you get a leeway actually controlling it and monitor the kinetics. And from the kinetics, you understand what, how the electron behave when it jump from one side of the molecule to another side. And that's the molecule they study. It's a cyanide with uh, uh, anthracene. So I didn't do anything, but uh, I would think uh, if I look at my crystal ball, I would love my colleague to do it if I have a colleague uh, uh, in, uh, in, at my university. All right, and you have a very good environment. In Canada, you can count a high pressure guy with five fingers. I add two more today for the two students, Simon Fraser, which I don't know of. <laughs> so it's very small community. So, so I go back with uh, the charge density, my love of uh, structures. So this is a calculated structure of lithium at very high pressure, 450 GPA. And you can see the ball, white ball, are the lithium atom. And there are electrocytes, that means electron localized in the interstitial site. It raised two questions, actually. One question is what are they doing there and why uh, they form this particular structure with, all, uh, with the electron in the interstitial site. The second thing is more important from an experimental point of view. Uh, lithium has three electrons. One has two, two has one. So the valence S electron removed it from the nucleus and from the electrocytes and pair up from the blob of the electron here, you end up with two lithium plus atom. Now if you get a good diffraction pattern, if you get a good diffraction pattern of 450 GPA, how are you going to solve it? When you do the re refinement, what do you do? You, you click, right? You click lithium, click lithium. So what's the scattering factor table? Calculate. Tell me anybody know how the scattering factor table calculated. Anybody look at the international table number volume two, the red book? Well, right now the blue book. It's a green now, I think. I have third generation behind. Early, sorry. They are calculated with Hartree Fox later. Not even the density functional. All right? And they calculate as an atom. So the scattering intensity, one third of it, gone out into the tissue. So there actually is an atom site. So you have to push through the atom. So if I know the structure, of course I push through the atom and account for that scattering intensity. But you don't know how you do that. So that's a question. At high pressure, you use the conventional, uh, if you use uranium, it's no problem. Because you're 92 uh, electron, it's totally dominated by the core. It doesn't change much, your scattering factor is good. But if you have a light element, first row, uh, what do you do? That's a question. All right? And you often see very funny structure, like half right structure, with electrolytes. Uh, this is, uh, again, the prediction of iron sodium 3. They sit in the middle. So what's the role of the electrolyte? Why is there? And why you have open framework? You would expect the more you compress, you've got uh, more uh, dense packed structure. Why you have open structures? In chemistry, we do one thing we do know. Structure is determined by directional bonding. So if some sort of electron located some orbital will give you the directional bonding. Now that's your, your chance to research. <laughs> that's why I see hot topics uh, challenge. All right, I haven't solved the problem. I just point out the problem to you. OK, theory. Everybody trusts theoretician. 
This is a paper two years ago, uh, prediction of lithium cesium. And they say lithium cesium only exists about 40, 50 or 60 GPA. Uh, that graph there. All right. And this paper <coughs> plot the electron density difference, and they see that the electron is being transferred from the system to the lithium. Uh, so paper came up last year in Nature Communication. They did the same thing. We're both citing this paper. They say a large transfer from lithium to cesium. Now, that really is a very fundamental problem. It's not that they did the wrong calculation. It's the thing how the different charge density when you're just to move in the interstitial region. Where you grab that uh, density. If you do molecular population analysis, you have to grab it by, by some atoms. If you do beta analysis, I, I can go through with you what's the problem with, okay? So, how you define charge density? That's crucial because if you read uh, Hoffman's book uh, on the structures, uh, solid state chemists, uh, he said, to know the solid structure here, you know where the electrons are. That's it. That's the key. So if you wear the, load the electron uh, resize, you can explain the structure, right? That, that's the whole thing about bonding theory in chemistry. So is theory right? All right, so I, 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 I skip it for a little while. I talk about charge density. How you got charge density? Without knowing the scattering factor. And also using very limited diffraction data. So in a diamond angle cell, your opening is, is what? How many degree? I mean, two theta, the biggest is the polar cell is 90 degree. So you've got 45 degree, all right? So you, you don't collect the whole Ava sphere, even in a single crystal. So you only truncated the low angle part of the diffraction. But the nucleus are located at high angle, uh, the, the information of the nucleus is a high angle data when the two theta is very large. So when I was doing my crystallography when I undergraduate, uh, you have to collect a very, very high angle. In fact, if you want to fit a good unicell size, you never use the low angle data, use the high angle data to get an accurate because it's more concentrated by the core electron. It turns out the maximum entropy is perfect for this uh, situation because you can always write an equation of the scattering factor due to the valence electron and the core electron, and they are separate in Q range. That means the two phaeton range. So you just take the load angle data, you only look at the valence electron distribution. That's the beauty of it. So that's what I did uh, with Hanfran. So we took the silicon in helium, and uh, of course, all of you know the sequence of transformation of silicon. It's a prototypical of a high pressure study, right? We skip all the phases, we go to hexagonal phase. We go here and a 25% volume uh, decrease. And only two phase transition in a hydrostatic medium at low temperature. All right? So all this total energy calculation, yes, correct. But most of the time you observe in the experiment a metastable phase. You skip it. So total energy calculation, you only look at the lowest energy structure, you might not get the right uh, conclusion. You should look at the next one or the one next to it. So that's a challenge. Is any method can actually give you with reliability, the second lowest energy structure is the second lowest energy structure. I have no doubt they found the lowest energy structure by whatever uh, algorithm you use. But the second one is not guaranteed. And there are methods to do it. All right, so I take that and compress it. You can see the electron density at uh, uh, low pressure. Uh, 14 uh, GPA and uh, at uh, 15, 16 GPA before transition, you can see the electron already spread out. The reason it's spread out because it involves the d orbitals. And eventually it goes uh, to the hexagonal phase, and this is a calculation. They're almost identical. All right? So the method by itself is approximate and actual entropy. A lot of people uh, do not believe it, but uh, to a certain extent it's quite useful. So more recently, we took a piece of germanium, single crystal and we do it uh, diffraction under high pressure. And uh, they have the same transition at 11 GPA from the FCC to the beta teen structure. And we take the 
actually density difference between two pressure points. Here's a 9 to 7, 10 to 7. Uh, I don't want to go into detail here. If you read the paper, this is, it looks like a D orbital. So even at around 7 GPA, the D participation in the bonding is already important. If you go to most uh, discussion, the metallization of germanium silicon is due to the D band come down and touch the valence band. But we find that that's the mixing is already at 7 GPA, way before, 4 GPA, before the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the transition. In uh, hindsight, it's not uh, difficult to understand because the thing doesn't go abrupt. It has to come down and come down. And the electron, in a single determinant, of course, it, the electron doesn't go up there. But if you do a full electron correlation consideration, the electron has to occupy some of those type uh, orbitals. So that actually will give you a very good picture with a single crystal data. So to go back to the lithium. So we actually want to test the lithium, uh, lithium cesium. Uh, look at this pressure here, it's 1.77 GPA. So if you put lithium and cesium together, just close the, uh, the cell, you already have uh, uh, many uh, peaks. It's showing me this is a mixed phase of alloys. We were lucky that we uh, have a 50-50, roughly 50-50. We uh, proportioned, we got a very well-defined diffraction pattern. You don't know that cubes cubic right away, primitive cubic. So what's the structure? It was the cubic of a cesium and lithium. Are they substitution alloy? That means the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the position are 50% cesium, 50% lithium, or they are all al the alloy. I don't know. So the easiest way is to take the intensity to a maximum entropy analysis. And you can count the electron density here. It is cesium, and this is lithium. It turns out that the CCM loses the electron to lithium for forming the P-loop here. So the electron actually from CCM to lithium at this pressure, very low pressure. Okay, it's around 10 GPA. All right. So why the theoretical uh, calculation isn't predicted, I don't know. The property is a metastable state. All right. And it's slightly uh, long stoichiometric. All right. It's not exactly... 1 and 1 is 1 to uh, 0 0.7, all right? Because we just put the metal together, we cannot really get a pure phase, all right? But it's actually easier to straight the method. Uh, if you can index a spectrum and you believe the intensity of the spectrum is good enough and you don't know the position, do a maximum entropy analysis. I once talked to uh, a very famous powder diffraction lady at uh, ETH. I thought I was crazy. Uh, because I, I was a skeptic. I do all these things first many years ago because I don't believe it. So I talked to her. She told me, well, it's nothing new. The biology has been using it all the time. It's all a protein structure. What they do is take the first couple of peaks, phase index it, and then just run the maximum entropy. It will give you the broad electron density of the uh, helixes. So you have to borrow technology from other fields. You have to talk to other people. If you are in doubt, talk to the expert. So one thing I didn't talk about here is uh, about time-resolved X-ray. I think most synchrotron now is very active on time-resolved X-ray. The reason is that technique now, you can actually increase pressure continuously, and you can control it. So why is it so interesting? You look at uh, sodium, it's a, uh, it, uh, if a CI-16 phase uh, was mentioned yesterday, and then when you compress it, uh, you can become more and more complex phase. So how it occurs? Can I map up the kinetics? Can I map up the intermediate states? Barium have a very similar uh, phase diagram. And one thing, when we uh, cool the barium at low temperature, it doesn't go to the uh, carbonate form, the cell carbonate structure, the complex uh, barium uh, four structure. It actually is a very simple uh, of a rhombic structure. So again, it's telling you, uh, kinetics is very important in high pressure. You just have to uh, cool it down, and you can see the transition between the barium-4, that's what uh, observed the complicated structure, the gas hole structure, is around uh, 100 Kelvin. So liquid nitrogen already changed the structure if you compress it cold, all right? So really the kinetic or the activation barrier is very low. 
from one structure to another. That's really the, the, the worst part of uh, doing theoretical calculation. You, you have the accuracy of 100 kT. So go back and calculate what 100 kT in uh, milli electron volt. All right. So uh, I was offered some beam time uh, at APS last year. So I say, well, the easiest thing is to do barium because uh, barium is very heavy. So we have good uh, diffraction intensity. I show you up oh, the, uh, the the movie of it. Oops, where is my pointer? Okay, okay, that's the time resolved. I'm doing 200 frames per second, 200 per second. It is uh, coming. You can see it expand because it go to smaller unit cell size. The peak goes up. You become more spotty. All right. All right, and then eventually, that's the complicated phase. So in between these two frames, I have more frames, okay? Uh, the problem is software. If you're a terabyte disk in half an hour, okay, you can run as fast as 1,000 hertz uh, with the detector right now, and the next generation with 3,000. So 3,000 diffraction patterns per second. Uh, it's a perfect for a first year graduate student to analyze it. Do 10 a day, uh, one year we will analyze completely. Software, artificial intelligence, I'll try to map out the thing when it changed and how it changed, right? So, this all the system, why I love it, I probably overspend my time. A lot of, uh, actually this is very new. This is the first paper I see people put actually a glass into a, uh, in a diamond ambu cell. So if you believe them, they say that's a phase transition here. All right, well it's true, anyway. And then the sub uh, several subsequent work in later year, if you take this material, the ser uh, serenium aluminum, and you compress it again, you form crystal again. So uh, you have a crystal, uh, amorphous, amorphous transition, and become crystal again. They tell you like, something. So what's the difference between a crystal and an amorphous solid? A crystal has long range ordering whatever long range means, <laughs> all right? A glass is intermediate to short range ordering. You can go from a glass to a crystal telling you pressure somehow have all the parameters you can control and go from glass to the crystal. Think about another way. From the crystal back to glass, it tells you something about how glass form and what the glass structure is. It's fairly fundamental to understand glass, right? So the more interesting, Dave Mao and this group is really good. Another development is the X-ray tom uh, tom uh, tom uh, tomography. He, they can measure the size change of this glass, metallic glass, as a function of pressure. You can see that the higher pressure gets smaller and smaller. So they know the initial volume. So they ask, you can then calculate the, uh, from here, uh, pixel by pixel count. They got a final volume so they can get the density of the material at a given pressure. It's very difficult uh, quantity to get is the density of a glass. So after they do that, normally if they have a three-dimensional solid, the uh, density with the so-called uh, first diffraction peak, uh, strong diffraction peak of, the, uh, of a glass should be three because it's three dimension. And they got around 2.5. So is the bonding in glass is not three-dimensional, but 2.5. Say so two will be planar, right? One will be linear. They only interact linearly, right? So there's a lot of physics in there. More recently, a couple months ago, when you heat up the glass, you find they have a negative thermal expansion. Actually, it gets contracted. Okay, when you hit something, the glass, it contract. Okay, uh, people familiar with eyes, uh, that's not surprising. We know exactly what happened. I'm going to tell you the answer. So you can simulate it right now, okay? And you can actually we simulate uh, right at the same end, uh, pressure, this crystalline. It turned out that one thing most people forgot when you compress uh, a binary uh, glass, a binary system, any binary uh, system. When you compress it, the electron got rearranged. But the size, so called quote and quote the size, of the two, the ratio of them is not constant. You press sodium chloride, it is not exactly the same in ground state. And people forgot about it. After you understand it, it's so easy to understand uh, why it crystallized. I don't tell you 
the story. But the most important thing is the following: this graph here and uh, this couple of paper. It turned out that we all know that uh, for crystal solid, it's well known XCP, FCC, BCC packing, all well known. But for a binary uh, alloy, a binary system, there's no theory for packing a binary system. No rigorous theory, not until the last couple of years. Amazing. Why is it important? You know the bubble you pack a uh, gate from uh, your order from uh, Amazon.com, all those things they pack in those bubbles. How much bubble they use? What's the packing density? Actually, that's a industrial uh, need to understand it. It's a binary packing, all right, with a, a, an even sphere. <laughs> okay, so. Well, I, I probably stop. <laughs> I gotta go a little bit of th uh, thing. So the jam packing is important. The important thing is actually uh, the group the uh, Monaco has shown that's a direct relationship uh, between the uh, intermediate ordering using e X-ray inelastic scattering uh, with this uh, single crystal and glass. You can link it. You can actually have a link from the, the dispersion. And what they use is so-called uh, in us X-ray scattering, I don't can uh, explain it with a uh, time now. I think uh, Alfonso gave you a diagram uh, yesterday similar to mine. The push is to go to the Q, low Q region, low momentum transfer, because you look at the intermediate and long range uh, correlation. And two spectrometers just came out this year, last year. Uh, one is ESRF, this is ERSF, it's a multi-detector. So you can, in one shot, you can measure low and high angle data, the Q uh, value. And uh, with the resolution, uh, the lowest is 0.2. Uh, NSR2 uh, is just commission, is around 0.5. So a lot of things you can do with this kind of, uh, they have welcome people to use this kind of spectrometer with the good problem. We've been doing inelastic scattering for 15 years. Uh, most of us already can't think of anything to do with so low Q transfer. We have a workshop uh, a year ago. Uh, we, we uh, we just try to find something that's new to do. Uh, Q-transfer also help you to explain the structures. We can calculate all these things with a highly correlated method. So I, I just uh, talked about the last thing here. Uh, I think it's important for people doing calculations. So uh, lately, people will say there's some sort of Van der Waal functional. Uh, we all trust two things when we put in uh, our calculation, the pseudo-potential. Uh, VAS, how many people actually tested the pseudo-potential? How to construct it? How many people know how to uh, construct the potential? You have to know uh, that. Uh, second is how accurate the, the functional you use. There's uh, two things that build in the program in which you normally don't look at it. You don't even define it in an in, in car file. All right? So one is, of course, uh, the uh, Van der Waal forces. We all know that DFT is no good for a weak interacting system, blah, blah, blah. So there was a development uh, some years ago by uh, a uh, uh, long quiz in 2004, and it's uh, my big surprise. The first thing they try is the hydrogen bond system. If you find that, yes, you can improve the, the normal density of ice, but this Van der Waal functional become more and more important at higher pressure. Anybody explain to me why? Well, when you press the two atoms together, the Van der Waal interaction is, uh, becomes stronger? Is that not the Van der Waal interaction they're talking about? It's just a misnomer. He parameterized a functional that satisfies the long range and short range part of the interaction curve. So we should call functional X, Y, Z, not call Van der Waal functional. Van der Waal functional is one of the corrections they made, and quite successfully. But you look at argon and krypton, the repulsive part between the one without this functional, GGA, and the Van der Waal functional with uh, DF, you can see huge difference. So anything at very high pressure is wrong if you do a PPE. Definitely wrong, I can tell you. You put a Van der Waal functional, it corrects somewhat. But we do not have a functional we can really rely on. That's the problem of the calculation of solid hydrogen at this moment. I mean, after we know that it doesn't work, the PPE, but people still are doing it. They say, oh, we just scale it, right? But your pressure way off, right? If you take the tangent of this here. So at the low end, it doesn't work either. We're trying to do bromine, and there's all the functional, there's experimental points here. 
uh, this is eye of the beholder. The best argument actually is the so-called green meat potential, in which it's not a functional, it's an empirical parameters, and shouldn't work at high pressure. So, so I just uh, uh, leave it with you, and the last comment here is structural prediction. There's a many structural prediction. First of all, we have to improve the e uh, efficient and reliability. Have you ever tried to use two methods to predict the same structure? And you'll be nice to know. The ranking of uh, energy, uh, lowest energy structure. Those methods designed to give you the low, uh, global minimum. They're not guaranteed for the second uh, structure, it's the second lowest energy structure. But in experiment, most of the time, you look at kinetic control. So there may be second and third structures, right? Uh, transition path, how to go from one and other. You optimize more than one optimization and temperature effect. Those are the growth area. I'll give you an example, PX3. You look at the archive, just came up three days ago. Uh, PX3 is a superconductor at a 100, uh, 100 K superconductor, all right, at 200 Kelvin. We predict two structures here and have the same TC. And this higher energy than that. Same TC, higher energy than that. So what, which one you choose? As a chemist, I choose this one. The reason is you're breaking all the pH bond here. This is a, a, a forceless polymer. How can you have enough energy to form a polymer when you compress it? Just by compression. So it's a metastable state. It's more likely. I don't know. but uh, Another thing is high temperature. We talk about temperature and we comment on how accurate calculation is. Uh, a lot of people just use quasi-harmonic uh, approximation. Uh, Quasi-harmonic uh, approximation of a problem. You have to understand what the by temperature is. Normally, the rule of thumb, three times the denied temperature, it will deviate. The best test case is calculated thermal expansion coefficient. You can see that it starts to deviate at, uh, at a certain uh, uh, temperature. Quasi-harmonic never work at uh, near the melting point. And if you look at a lot of paper on melting of iron earth core, they use quasi-harmonic. 6,000 Kelvin, 360 GPA. There are no other good method to do it. They buy the bullet, and you have a big computer time and big computer. You can calculate all these properties. I recently I interested in a mixed alloy of uh, impurity in molten iron. So we calculate viscosity compared to pure iron, what kind of effect. So this is some preliminary result. It looks like that. Uh, if you have uh, sulfur impurities, it will be lower with viscosity than iron. So in the just the outer core, maybe it is uh, uh, has some uh, difference. So, well, I don't want to go there. This is the final challenge as a F block um, uh, material. So, well, I spend more than enough time allocated to me. Thank you very much. That's what the crystal ball is going to look like. So you trust it. I'm not trust it, it's up to you. Okay, thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Are there any good methods of detecting a glass transition temperature, or is it just a maximum of direct flow? No, it's below the glass transition temperature. It's all below the glass transition temperature. A typical case, if you're interested, look at amorphous ice. It, uh, it's well studied. In the, in the single crystal germanium data you showed us, yeah. stuff, what was the temperature this was like? uh, Room temperature. Mm. And what is the energy level spacing? I, I, I can't remember. Germany, uh, germanium is a, uh, is a direct gap, right? So, so probably 1.5 1, 1, 1. EV, I don't think. <laughs> Yes, Stefan. Uh, liquid iron sulfide with sulfur impurities. Yeah, but uh, comparable to iron, right? Comparable to iron. This is Dar uh, Dari Elfi uh, result. Yep. Right. Calcium carbonate. That's another good, that's why I got into the picture, calcium viscosity, because of the calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, the viscosity, is as low as water. 
Hans. Yes, Hans. Don, I have a very special question. Yeah. But might be as a high pressure guy and a chemical system of the chemical optimal person for that. Do you see any indication or any chance to make my high pressure an engineering material of uh, similar or better qualities as nowadays higher noise? I don't even know the subject, but uh, my speculation when you have radioactive decay, just two things here, you emit a radiation of neutron, and then you heat up the system. That is sort of creating defects, right? And the defects, uh, when you form defects, the mechanical properties will degrade, right? So, I don't know. I think if you think about it, is you should see that if you are bombarded with all this neutron in, in your nuclear reactor, and what the isotope with absorbing that neutron, what the decay looks like, and what's the glass formation, and uh, what's the lifetime of the decay affecting the structure. In fact, well, private will tell you, you know what I'm doing. You know, the, our beam line, that's one of the projects we've tried to do, right? We do total diffraction of a glass, and we want to look at exactly what you said. Yeah. You bring in a sample, we do the total diffraction, and we fully transform it back uh, as a function of time, to see what the radioactivity do to the structures, all right? So that's what, uh, yeah. So I think we have to thank the speaker again.